<laughs> Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Video Psychosis Podcast. I am your host, Strong Knots, musician, writer, all around film aficionado. And the point of this podcast, my goal specifically, is to try to bring to you obscure or just kind of off the wall movies. There's a kind of joy that film lovers get out of finding these weird little movies and sharing them amongst each other, and that's kind of our mission statement. We want to spread the love to you, and we'd love to hear your feedback. For this very first episode, we are going to focus specifically on Halloween. For Halloween, a lot of people tend to take the challenge where you try to watch at least 31 movies for the month basically a film a day there and I personally like to take that challenge I tried to beat my record from 2017 and I ended up doing that I ended up watching 68 movies for Halloween and the purpose of this first episode of this podcast I'd like to talk to you about each of those films there's a lot on there you might recognize I'd like to think there's some variety in the list I tried to pick classics foreign films monster movies pretty much everything you can think of so we're gonna take Take a look at every single one of these movies. Maybe you'll totally disagree with me. If you do, I hope you'll write to me or respond to this podcast, and maybe we can have a conversation about movies. Because once again, that's the whole point. Let's open this up and spread the love. I am a horror junkie, and this is going to be a very fun episode. I can't wait to share some of these with you. We're going to split this podcast into two halves, 34 films per episode. This is part one of two. So let's kick it off, and I'm going to remind the audience we are streaming and screaming straight from hell. So let's begin this thing. Once again, I'm Strong Knots. This is the Video Psychosis Podcast. Number one. The Invisible Man, 1933. James Whale. I really liked this movie. Uh, It's probably one of my favorite of the Universal Monster movies, the classic series. I watched The Invisible Man along with The Wolfman, 1941, for the first time this year. They're movies that I've always wanted to get around to. I'm just now finding the time for because I'm constantly playing catch up when it comes to movies. And it seems like Frankenstein and Dracula seem to hog up a lot of the credit when the Universal films get talked about. And honestly, I think the consensus seems to pretty much agree these days that Bride of Frankenstein is a better film than the original Frankenstein, and I agree with that. But as good as both of those films are, I think The Invisible Man and The Wolfman from 1941 are much more enjoyable, and I would go so far as to say probably better films than Dracula and Frankenstein. The Invisible Man is a movie that's pretty personal to me. I'm surprised I didn't watch it before. I'll give you a little backstory. When I was in eighth grade I did my second play in middle school and I had played Macbeth in seventh grade and now for eighth grade my follow-up I got to play the invisible man and I actually hadn't seen any of the movies but I always thought it was a pretty neat concept and it was really fun doing that play had to wear like a panty over my head you know but uh, I got to crib a little movement from this Godard film Alphaville and so I've always kind of had this yearning to see that movie and for a film from 1933 it holds up very well a lot of audiences have a harder time watching these older movies it seems like anything made before the 60s and when it comes to the horror genre you see a lot of films that are hugely influential and it's interesting that you can go back and watch a lot of these and they retain their value the invisible man has some really great effects in it there's a lot of humor in it because there's scenes where The Invisible Man is pretty much just going around trolling people, you know, like he's kicking police officers on the butt, and uh, he's like throwing empty beer pitchers at these shrieking barmaids, and he's really just running around causing absolute mayhem, and the townspeople are offering the police their ridiculous suggestions for catching him, like, just carry around some black ink, and if you think you feel something in front of you, throw the ink and it'll stick to him, you know, all this kind of ridiculous stuff. And ultimately, in the end, the way they catch the Invisible Man is pretty interesting. I thought it was a neat way to dissolve the story, kind of end everything. It's really short, too. I think it's under 80 minutes, so you've definitely got time to watch that. I would recommend it, not even just as Halloween viewing. It really is a classic. 
and deservedly so. Which brings us to number two, The Wolfman, 1941, on this Halloween list. I just talked a little bit about that one, and like I said, I do like it better than Dracula and Frankenstein. I think Lon Chaney is an amazing actor. He has this a sort of sadness to him, where in a lot of these roles you sympathize with him because he just looks kind of beaten down. He's a little bit downtrodden, and uh, he brings this sort of warmth with that. Lon Chaney has this charisma, and he absorbs these roles. He just gets really into them, and you always see a distinct part of his personality, not necessarily as an actor, but maybe even as a person. There always seems to be something real behind the character, and Lon Chaney really sells the movie. He's great. You feel really bad for the Wolfman, and Bella Lugosi uh, has a small scene in the film. This podcast will have spoilers in it, but a lot of these movies are older, and if you haven't seen them yet, you know, feel free to skip ahead. I don't want to ruin anything for you, but there will be those kinds of discussions, so prepare for that. The Wolfman, of course, Bela Lugosi gets killed off. He's not around very long. The film keeps you invested in the story through that sympathy for Lon Chaney, because no matter what's happening when he transforms and goes out there at midnight and begins killing when he comes back, he's totally confused, and of course, you, f you see him falling for this mythology of what a wolf man is, you know, the old lycanthrope tales, and they're like sort of ancestral, like they're handing down these stories, and he starts to buy into it, and he's turning into one, and you see him slipping away, and there's a, there is a sadness in there, and Lon Chaney's perfect for that. So the wolf man, highly recommended. Number three on the list. The Curse of the Cat People, 1944. Pretty fantastic film. It's the sequel to Cat People. It's uh, kind of a different film from the first Cat People. I liked it. I liked both of them. I would say I probably prefer the first film. It's a little closer to the horror genre. This story is sort of strange. It takes a dramatic turn. It focuses on this little girl who is seeing the ghost of the character from the first film, the cat woman of the first film. And she ends up getting into all this trouble and I was surprised that it wasn't strictly a genre film, but a lot of people seem to prefer that one to the, the first film, and I enjoyed it. I didn't feel it was slight or anything. I thought it was well-written. There were some good performances in it. I would have liked a little bit more tension, considering that the first film has some great scenes of suspense, like that swimming pool bit, but it was a good film. Definitely recommend it if you like that kind of stuff. Number four. Dead of Night, 1945. And this is a special one because now we're starting to move into anthology horror films, which I am a big fan of. I watch a lot of those, the cheap ones, the famous ones. It's a genre I'm pretty invested in. I've always liked that kind of stuff. I used to read scary stories when I was a kid. I've appeared on another podcast, the, the Bracken Basement podcast, talking about anthology films with some other people. And there's going to be a lot of these films discussed on this list. Dead of Night is definitely among the influential ones. The very last story has been mimicked a few times, and there's even a film on my list coming up later that's a little bit reminiscent of Dead of Night. But this film is really good. The wraparounds, a lot of times the wraparounds kind of seem like a filler, and you're delivering what the audience really wants, which is these short stories, but you have to kind of bookend them, so you're not just giving people this clunky, run-together sort of thing. And Dead of Night has a really interesting series of bookends with these characters in a house, and one of them has had a dream where he's seen all of them before and they're doing things in real life that he saw them do in the dream. And it does have that surreal feeling to it where it almost feels kind of like a Boone Well movie. This sort of surreal situation, nobody quite knows what's going on, everybody's taken in by it. And there's a few films on this list that also reflect that sort of sentiment, I think, just that very odd notion of deja vu and is this real, is this a dream? A lot of horror films play in that. Dead of Night was probably... One of the first, I would say, that did it in a way that was unique at the time. It's been imitated since, so if you watch a lot of movies, you've undoubtedly seen references to it in that department. But Dead of Night is really fantastic, and it's not even among... Well, it might be one of the first anthology films, but it's not the first. I previously talked on a prior podcast about the film Waxworks, a German film from the 20s, and I believed at the time that was the first anthology horror film. But actually, there's a movie from 1919 called Eerie Tales, which was kind of split up and re-released. 
And that might be the very first one, I believe. So Dead of Night comes about 20 years, a little over 20 years after those two films. But it definitely influenced a lot of other horror films, and especially anthologies in that way. Number five on the list. Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, 1948. In case you haven't noticed, I'm moving through these movies chronologically by the year of their release. So we're going to go from the oldest to the newest. And this movie is a classic for many reasons. It's really funny. And if you're in it to see the Universal Monsters, you're not going to be disappointed. You get tons of that. Aside from meeting Frankenstein, Abbott and Costello get to meet Dracula, the Wolfman. There's a lot of great gags in this movie. It's definitely worth watching if you're a fan of slapstick comedy, if you like stuff like the Marx Brothers or W.C. Fields. It's got this light-hearted kind of approach to it that really works for the material. And you can tell they had a great time making it, and it reflects on that because it's just fun to watch it. That's an example, once again, of a classic film that I think could serve a lot of modern audiences pretty well. I think they'd understand the humor and the approach to it. Have a good time with that one. I know I did. Number six. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Don Siegel, 1955. I had seen the 70s remake, the Philip Kaufman one, before this, and some of the Abel Ferrara version from the 90s. Been meaning to catch up with this film for a long time, and I really liked it. This is, humorously enough, the first of two movies on this Halloween viewing list to feature notorious director Sam Peckinpah in a rare acting role. Uh, in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, he plays a meter man, he comes to check the meter. I think his name is Charlie. And it's just a very small thing, but you can't help but laugh seeing this infamous alcoholic crazy man who directed some of the world's most disturbing, violent movies. And not necessarily all the time. You can look at Junior Bonner as a perfect example of something different from his usual work. But Peckinpah, mostly known for being a very bloody director, and to see him just reading somebody's meter for about five seconds is quite funny, I felt. And this is a film that works really well. People have said that you could remake that movie every decade and just change the social context, you know, what it's about, how it's reflecting the times, and the story would still work, and I definitely agree with that. It's kind of a sci-fi horror hybrid, and there is a genuinely unsettling moment in the movie that I really liked, where there's a body on a pool table. This body, supposedly a corpse, has just sort of materialized out of nowhere on a pool table and they've noticed that the corpse's face doesn't have fully formed features and it's very odd it's almost like a human that's pre-development it's not quite fully human and as it begins to develop it takes on the appearance of the barman himself very creepy stuff there again this is a movie that's been imitated and remade in a number of ways over the years so you might not be quite as blown away since you've seen a lot of this stuff before but kevin mccarthy is really fun in it as the lead actor and there's a lot of great moments in it and it's you know kind of classic 50s paranoia stuff so that's always interesting number seven invasion of the saucer men 1957 this is kind of one of those response movies to invasion of the body snatchers it was a big movie when it came out, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And it led to sort of imitators or people who wanted to cash in on the title, maybe to make a few bucks. You know, we talked about Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And this is in the same vein as that, but less slapstick. And more kind of a parody of the sci-fi horror genre. But it's got some genuinely gross stuff in it, which is interesting. Not unlike Fiend Without a Face from around the same time. There's a little bit of gore, which you don't really ever expect to see in 50s horror films, I think. And it is pretty funny. There's a lot of breaking the fourth wall. If you don't like this kind of stuff, that might turn you off. But it was definitely an influence on the Mars Attacks series, which Tim Burton made that film of in the 90s. I would recommend it to people if you like older horror films, and if you like horror comedies, it's definitely a good combination of the two there. Number eight. The Fly, 1958. This is the original with Vincent Price, uh, who isn't even the lead. The lead, I believe, is played by Brett Halsey, and I was surprised at how much I liked this movie. It really surprised me. There's moments in the film that are really actually freaky when you see i don't think this is spoilers to say because it's become such a classic moment and it's like join the pantheon of famous movie quotes everybody knows about the little fly voice going help me, help me. but when you actually see that moment in the film it's it's absolutely shocking and there's this little effect shot of the spider with the doctor's head on it and it is really just grotesque looking 
And it really is a great freak out moment. I think I would love to see a 50s crowd reacting to that. I think it would be really funny. It still holds up. It's a great movie. Remade, of course, in the 80s by Cronenberg, which is a fantastic film also. And that brings us to the next film on the list, Return of the Fly, 1959. They made a follow-up film the year after the original because of its success. The movie really holds up, too. It's a little bit campier, definitely a lot pulpier than the first one. The first film makes you believe in this ridiculous scenario. And, you know, it's that classic cliche of the mad scientist, but he's really not so mad. He's a guy that loves his wife and his son in the first film, and he's a pretty easygoing guy, smoking the pipe in the lounge kind of guy. And when he gets turned into this guy with a fly head and a fly hand, you really do feel bad for him. And the sequel to it, the basic premise is that his son, who has survived and gone on to science, has become obsessed with his father's older work, And he's a good guy, too. He's a relatable character. They try to make him a good guy. And he ends up, you know, falling for the same mistake that his dad made. But not necessarily because of his obsession with science. He has this sidekick who turns out to be a con man. And the sidekick steals his research. He's going to sell it off to this, like, really sleazy, sweaty dude who looks like the classic film noir bad guy. He's, like, just got sweat rolling down the the rolls on his chin and he's you know one of those cigar smoking types i think he works in a morgue in the film which is really funny to me this is exactly the guy you want handling your beloved family members corpses but the second film definitely amps up the humor there's not really a lot of humor in the first film and it takes itself seriously which is part of the reason it works the second film gives you a lot more of what you want to see and there's A really hilarious bit that I recall, I think it's a guinea pig that has human hands or human feet, something like that. You know, they try to do one of their tests with the disintegrator and it just comes out nightmarish. But the effects in the second film aren't as good as the first film. And it's kind of interesting to take note that the 1958 film, the original, is in color. And it almost has like this Douglas Cirque look to it at times. But the sequel, just a year later, is in black and white. Uh, It's almost like they just had to churn another one out on the cheap. But I think it really works. And it is funny. It is pulpier, like I said. You get more of that revenge movie element toward the end. And there is a happy ending to the film that ordinarily might not work for this kind of thing. But definitely serves its purpose here. So I would recommend both The Original Fly and Return of the Fly. Definitely a great double feature there. Next film on the list, we're going to be moving some more into Vincent Price territory here. House on Haunted Hill, 1959, William Castle. I'd seen 13 Ghosts in the old-fashioned red and blue 3D several years back at the Plaza Theater in Atlanta. They used to do this series that they've recently brought back called the Silver Scream Spook Show. And every month they would play an older horror film and there would be a kids show during the day and a burlesque show with like comedic intros and stuff for the adults late at night. And I saw 13 Ghosts at the late night screening and I wasn't really blown away by the movie. I saw The Tingler and it was fun, but it's not something I would feel the need to watch over and over again. William Castle is pretty much known as being the ultimate showman, you know, the kind of This isn't just a horror movie, it's an experience. And, you know, he would throw in all these gimmicks. And I think House on Haunted Hill is definitely his strongest film that I've seen. It really does take this sort of crime movie plot and puts it in this horror dimension. And it's an interesting mixture. You've got that actor, I forget what his name is at the moment, but he was in The Killing, that Stanley Kubrick film also made in the 50s from the Jim Thompson screenplay. He's known pretty much, you see him play these sad sack characters in films. He appears in another film that's on my Halloween list, Dead of Night, the TV movie from 1977. He's in one of the stories there too. But in this film, he uh, he's one of the people staying at Vincent Price's house. And of course, the classic setup is you have to stay all night in this creepy house, and if you die before the night's over, poo-poo for you. And it gets this element where you want to watch who's going to stay alive, who's not, and there's twists along the way. And the classic gimmick that Castle used when that film came out is that he would send this fake skeleton flying out through the audience over their heads, because there's a skeleton in the film, and it would, you know, drive everybody out of their chairs. Just absolute insanity. But the movie really holds up quite well, and I think it's a lot more entertaining than 13 Ghosts or The Tingler. I still need to see Homicidal and Bug and some of his other stuff, but I like William Castle. I think he's an interesting guy, and this film is really entertaining. Vincent Price, 
doesn't really ham it up. He's got that perfect nasty tone, not unlike his role in Theater of Blood from the 70s. And it's a really fun film. It holds up. You can watch it now. It's a good late night movie. It definitely has atmosphere. And I think probably, like I said, Castle's most accomplished movie. So moving on from that, now we're into the 60s. Carnival of Souls, 1962, Herc Harvey. I've been wanting to watch that film for a very long time. I remember when it was in the public domain for just what seemed like forever, and it wasn't a hard film to find. And I used to edit music videos with classic horror films, and it kind of gave me some editing experience, but I mostly did it for fun, just to kind of... I liked cutting these movies up with totally unorthodox music. And Carnival of Souls was a movie that I tried to do a video with before I'd actually seen the full film. And I thought it was perfect because it had really good cinematography. You watch the film now, there's a lot of really cool things in it. The titles are great. The main actress is really good in the film. She has this sense that conveys a confusion that's stereotypical to the characters in these films where they feel like the living dead. Are they a corpse? Did they die? Am I still alive? Am I a ghost? What's happening? The main actress really sells it. I love the scenes of her playing the organ. And of course, you know, there's no way this woman is going to be allowed to play in the church since she's so disconnected from it. And it's really funny, that bit where the preacher fires her. It's a sad moment, but it's pretty obvious it's going to happen from the minute she gets the job. She is definitely a member of the secular world, and the film follows her in her path, walking with the ghosts. And I really like all of those scenes with the pale-faced bald guy that keeps haunting her and showing up in her car window. And everywhere she goes, she turns around and she sees this guy staring back at her. And it is really creepy. And I don't think I'm the only person that thinks that. It's been released and re-released by Janus Films, and George Romero has admitted that it was a huge influence on making Night of the Living Dead, which is obviously a classic. Carnival of Souls should get more exposure. I feel like more people should watch it. Like I said, there's a lot of films on this list that are made before the 60s that I think would be accessible to modern audiences. And I've heard a lot of people say that Carnival of Souls is kind of campy to them. And maybe aside from a few stilted line deliveries, because the actors aren't professional, but they do a good job for the most part. I didn't find anything really campy about it. I enjoyed being in its world. Would definitely recommend this movie. There's a remake. It seems pretty pointless. It's kind of a cut and dry thing. And it's really the atmosphere and the direction, because it is pretty well put together, I think, that makes the movie. And I think Carnival of Souls would make a great double feature with Messiah of Evil, that 70s film, also known as Dead People. They both have this weird dreamlike feeling to them, and they do both seem to be about isolation and living among people that might not necessarily be people, after all. Number 12. Black Sabbath, Mario Bava, 1963. And this was my very first time watching the film. I've wanted to see it for a long time, but I knew I would wait until the right moment because I just wanted to be totally absorbed in it. And I was. I did not watch the Italian version, which has kind of a different color scheme, and the telephone story is a little bit different. There's a lesbian subplot to it, and that was trimmed down for the AIP release, the English dubbed version, which is what I watched. And as my first viewing of the film, I have to say I really liked it. I'm really looking forward to seeing the Italian version. This is one of about 15 or 16 foreign films I watched this year, or at least films made outside the U.S. And the hype lives up. It's a great movie. It really is a classic. Boris Karloff does the bookends, and he's sort of like the classic Crypt Keeper role, sort of like your spooky guide to the movie. And there's these really colorful backdrops behind him that almost make him look like, uh, what was it, Leopold Stokowski in Fantasia or something. The way he's presented in this sort of aura, you know, because he is a legend in the horror genre. And the stories are all really good. I didn't dislike any of them. I actually like the story with the stolen ring which I think is the first story the most. That's probably my favorite. And I think the Italian version puts that last. The sequencing is different in the two releases. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the Italian version of that, probably next year. Second film of the 60s from this list is going to be Goke, Body Snatcher from Hell, 1968. This is a Japanese film. It was released by the Criterion Collection not too long ago in this DVD set they put out when horror came to Shochiku. And it's also got films like Genocide on it. Goke is a really interesting movie. It's not necessarily a straightforward horror film. It is 
part of that science fiction hybrid, but it's also a political film to an extent. It's got a really good story. I really liked Go K. I would like to see this film again. I thought the effects were marvelous, especially that silvery sort of mercury-like liquid that drips into people's split foreheads and takes them over and makes them a victim of the body snatchers. I thought the effects were really cool. And it starts off in an interesting way because it's people on a plane that there's a bomb on. The plane ends up crashing and these people are stuck on a little island together. And of course the body snatcher gets in with them. I believe they're called the Goke Midori. And it begins to take them over one by one. And it becomes one of those who will be the last one, what will be left of them type of scenarios. Really great movie. Worth watching, especially if you like Japanese films. My final film that I watched for Halloween of the 1960s. It's going to be classic stuff, Coffin Joe, who doesn't love him? The Strange World of Coffin Joe, 1968. Once again, this is another anthology film, just like Black Sabbath or Dead of Night, 1945. And in this case, Strange World of Coffin Joe is a mixed bag for sure, which seems to be most people's approach to anthology films. I tend to like stories in general. I'm pretty easy to entertain, so... It has to be really boring, or there just has to be something off for me to not even enjoy one of the weaker stories in an anthology film. I'm looking directly at Things 2 by Dennis Devine, which has some pretty forgettable stories in it. I think there's about two stories with a bookend, and I remember the bookend being more entertaining. But The Strange World of Cough and Joe, not a bad film. I would recommend it, especially if you like his movies. I've always been a huge fan of At Midnight, I'll Take Your Soul. I saw that when I was in middle school. It made a huge impact on me. And, you know, of course, This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse is great. And he gets to play the role of Coffin Joe in the final story of this anthology, which is definitely the best story. The second story feels a little inconclusive. I guess it's supposed to be shocking because it's about necrophilia, but there doesn't really seem to be any finalization on it. But you watch enough of these films, I don't know, it's hard to gauge. But I just didn't quite get what they were going for at the end of the second story. The first one is pretty good. It's about this guy and his daughters, and they make dolls. And, of course, their uh, house gets broken into by these really rough guys who are going to tough them up and try to take the old man's money. And it's nothing you probably haven't seen before. But the third story, the one with Coffin Joe, the last story, really seals the deal on the movie. It becomes this super blasphemous uh, recreation of The Last Supper. And God is basically played by Coffin Joe. And it's him creating the sick, sad world around him. It's fantastic. I can't say no to a movie with a cannibalistic Last Supper. It's great. The movie on the whole is not one of the better anthology films, I would say, but definitely watch it, especially if you haven't seen many Brazilian films. Now we move into the 1970s with the list, and the first film I'm going to talk about is Devil Times 5 from 1974. It's got one of my favorite alternate titles for a movie, People Toys, which is really ominous sounding. I think it does sound a little absurd, but it's a better title than Devil Times 5. And my history with this movie... I have a DVD collection of, I think it's 42nd Street Forever, where they show trailers for all these different movies from the old grindhouses, exploitation, action films, crime stuff, horror, comedy, this big mixed bag of trailers from back in the day. And I saw the Devil Times 5 trailer a long time ago and thought it looked spectacular. And having seen the film now, I would say do not watch the trailer before you see the movie because it'll spoil a lot. Uh, this is a movie that is surprising even having seen the trailer. I was expecting this movie to maybe be a little forgettable or kind of vanilla but it's definitely an odd duck i would put it among the most bizarre killer kid movies that i've seen it's not as suspenseful as something like bloody birthday by ed hunt who i'm a big fan of and it's not as cheesy as something like maybe Mikey or the paper boy those 90s killer kid movies but devil times five is really unruly and just has some really uh, kind of exasperating content in it. It broaches into uncomfortable territory and stays there for the duration. There's a really sleazy cat fight in there for all you Something Weird fans. Uh, there's a lot of just odd things about this movie. And the ending to it is really good. I like films with a darker ending or that take that kind of cynical approach in their ending. And this definitely has that. There's one thing that made me laugh. Right before the credits come up, there's a little bit of text that comes on screen and it says, THE BEGINNING, all capitals. 
like no question mark you know it's just the beginning roll credits and uh that made me laugh pretty hard but devil times five definitely worth seeing if you're expecting a slow burn 70s horror movie you're not going to get it uh there's some good deaths in that movie I think it's pretty enjoyable, but not for everybody, so be warned. And that's probably one of the tamer films on this list that's not for everybody, so buckle up as we slide along. Number 16. is going to be the Amicus Anthology film From Beyond the Grave, 1974. I really like this movie, but once again, I am a fan of these films. I like the British ones, stuff like Asylum, 1972, Tales from the Crypt, the original film, Freddy Francis, uh, Vault of Horror is probably one of the weaker ones, but From Beyond the Grave is really good. Peter Cushing is your host for this movie, and I like the gimmick of his bookends. He plays this guy who owns a shop, and in his shop he sells people like cursed items, and these little trinkets and toys and snuff boxes and stuff like that that will end up cursing them or giving them some sort of horrible fate like a monkey's paw type situation. And Peter Cushing is a joy in it, as per usual. It's always fun to see him appear. There's a story about somebody who inherits, gets this mirror that it turns out they look long enough into after having a seance and they begin to see the reflection of someone that is not them. And it's this malevolent force that begins to command them to do its bidding. And that was probably my favorite story. I think that's the first story in the film. Uh, it's consistent throughout. This is definitely one of the best Amicus anthologies. And I wouldn't call any of the stories bad. The last story has a little bit too happy of an ending for me, but that's not really a gripe. And the bookends for this one are a lot more original than Tales That Witness Madness, which is pretty close to other films, stuff like Asylum. So definitely worth watching. Number 17. From 1974, it's an Italian film called The Tempter, a.k.a. The Antichrist. Directed by Alberto Di Martino. This was an interesting movie. It's an exorcist knockoff, of course. There's some great sacrilegious stuff in it, which you come to expect from these demon possession movies. And I actually got a VHS of this, along with something else, this Mario Bava film, The House of Exorcism, where he didn't even want his name on that cut of the film, so he goes by Mickey Lion. And The Tempter is a lot better than The House of Exorcism. It has a lot of psychedelic stuff in it. I believe Ennio Morricone did the music, which is fantastic. Morricone definitely doesn't get enough credit for his horror scores, I feel. A lot of them are very much like soundscapes, where they take on sound effects and reverberate them, and you get these sort of echoes and whispers and just little eerie things like that. The Tempter might not be everybody's cup of tea. I enjoyed it. It's pretty much among its genre. I wouldn't call it a classic or anything, but worth seeing if you like those movies. There are a lot of maybe intentionally or unintentionally hilarious moments in it so if you're a big bad movie fan then you'll enjoy that moving on to the next film on this list dead of night 1977 made for tv movie dan curtis directing this was a good movie not as good as the 1945 version although it's not necessarily a remake of it per se it's just a you know kind of an alteration you've got different stories and I don't recall there being bookends in this movie. There's a story with Ed Begley Jr. that I quite liked. I believe that's the first story in the film. He gets this older car, and he restores it, fixes it up, he gets it running. He takes it out on the back roads instead of the highway, and he ends up driving into the past, and he ha someone steals his car, and he has to walk back home. And eventually he gets back to the present time. And at some point he finds an older gentleman that's his girlfriend's father and he's in possession of the car that's exactly like his. And it's one of those time travel stories. Richard Matheson worked on some of the stories for this and of course they're really entertaining if you're a fan of The Twilight Zone or any of his work. It's in that same vein. Uh, not one of my favorite anthology horror films, but like I said, a good movie. Pretty passable. The next film on the list is going to be the first on the list that I have already seen before viewing it for Halloween. How Sue. 1977, Nobuhiko Obayashi. There's not really a lot to say about this movie. If you haven't seen it, then what are you doing? If you have seen it, then you just know. I've shown this film to a lot of people. I saw it theatrically twice when Janus Films released it, somewhere around 2007 to 2009, 
And I just fell in love with it, and a lot of other people have, because it's a really unique movie. There's a lot of great effects. The music is fantastic. It's super funny and doesn't take itself seriously at all, and it's not afraid to experiment visually and throw all these weird sort of techniques in your face and tell you, don't worry about the story, just flow with it, just coast with us. And it really is one of the most enjoyable movies ever made. It's appropriately... Nuts. It's a crazy movie. Out of all the people I've shown it to, and all the people I know that have seen it, I can only think of maybe literally one or two people that didn't like it. But I know dozens and dozens of people who just love this movie, and it was kind of like a long-lost treasure for a while. It didn't have much U.S. exposure for a long time, and now it's probably, I would imagine, one of the top-selling titles in Criterion's library. It's a great movie. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. Next film on the list... The House of the Dead, 1978, also known as Alien Zone. This is a really, really good anthology movie. I had just heard of it for the first time within the last couple years, and so of course I immediately had to seek it out. Definitely worth it. It's got about maybe four to six stories in it, which I always love. I feel cheated by anthologies that only have two stories and bookends. You gotta throw at least three in there. That makes it a movie. Alien Zone, House of the Dead, gives you a shitload of stories, and they're all pretty good. The first one is a killer kid story that ends up turning into sort of a weird twist on the end. That's not quite necessary, I felt, but doesn't hurt the story. My favorite of all the stories in it would have to be this one about a guy who alienates himself from his co-workers and society, and he ends up getting trapped in this world where nobody cares about him. Nobody can hear him. He's trapped in this little room without other people, and it's sort of like a punishment for being antisocial. There's other films that have done stories similar to that. You could maybe look at what John Landis did with his Twilight Zone segment later in the 80s, the Vic Morrow one. Uh, kind of a similar thing where, you know, you look down on your fellow man, and you end up paying the price for it. And this one has a really great line in it. There's a part in that story where one of his co-workers asks if he wants to go have a cheeseburger with him. And uh, there's this joint that they're going to go to. And he says, 23 different kinds of cheeseburgers. Wow, who doesn't want that? It's like the Baskin Robbins of cheeseburgers. It sounds amazing. But that was my favorite story. You've probably seen similar stuff to it before, but I thought it was really effective. It should be noted that the director of The House of the Dead is a woman. Her name is Sharon Miller. You don't see a lot of anthology films directed by women. They just made one called Double X, XX, and I really didn't care for that film, nor did many that I know. So I think if you want to see a great anthology horror film directed by a woman, go back about 30 years before Double X and you got The House of the Dead. And Vinegar Syndrome just released it, so you have no excuse not to find it. If you don't want to pay for it, it's on YouTube, for Christ's sakes. Watch it. It's amazing. I thought it was great. Definitely one of my favorites that I've seen in quite a while. Next film on our Halloween viewing list, number 21, It Lives Again, 1978. Larry Cohen is just one of the greats. Uh, you have to respect the guy for going out and using guerrilla tactics to make studio films. He wouldn't get permits, he would just record on the street, and if anybody tried to maybe bump the camera off or something, you'll probably end up in the film. It'll look like some special effect. He's amazing. And It Lives Again is the sequel to It Lives. I think It Lives Again is a much better film than the first one, and it doesn't hurt that you've got Frederick Forrest in there from Apocalypse Now, One from the Heart, several other films. It Lives Again, I think is much more interesting than the first one because there's a lot of campiness to the first one and the second film isn't afraid to be directly humorous. It doesn't feel like it takes itself that seriously. But at the same time, you can see that Larry Cohen is putting that social relevance into the film by commenting on the parental role and how the government interferes with people's families and bodies. And there's a lot of things going on in the movie that give it a great political context, but it's just massively entertaining. You get the killer baby vision where they're like crawling up the stairs and stuff and that's, I got a big kick out of that. I'm a sucker for a lot of his movies and I would put this among the best and I would recommend the second film over the first one. It's one of those movies kind of like Video Violence 2. You don't really need to see Video Violence 1, but there's enough callbacks to it in the second film that if you really want to get those jokes, sure, watch the first movie, but I just like the second one better. And a lot of people would probably disagree with me on that, on both of these films. But uh, I really liked It Lives Again. Would strongly recommend it. Number 22 on the list, 
1978, Magic, directed by Richard Attenborough. And it's got Anthony Hopkins doing one of his finest performances. Very serious acting going on here. He's a crazy ventriloquist losing his mind. It's a really good movie. I did not expect to like this movie as much as I did. I've been putting off watching it for a long time. I lucked out and got a copy of the Dark Sky Films Blu-ray at this sort of little antique shop for like three bucks. And I've owned it for a couple years, but I just got around to watching it. And it really took me by surprise. I would say one of the only missteps in the film is the casting of Anne Margaret, but that's not even much of a problem to me. And for the more prurient tastes, you do get a little TNA there, so if that's what you're looking for, have fun. But she's not she's not too bad in the movie. The character doesn't have enough depth to it, but this is a horror film. You're not going in there expecting, like, Howard's End. A lot of the time, you're supposed to empathize with very basic hollow shells of what should be a person and the characters a lot of the times in horror films are pretty underwritten but like i said you're not going in for the character and anthony hopkins sells the hell out of his role so it more than makes up for any bad performance or like i said not even a bad performance just maybe underutilized but there's a lot of humor in this film, and I really do mean it when I say that Anthony Hopkins is fantastic in it. I'm not necessarily a fan of his in general, but I was blown away by him here. I thought he was really funny. I felt bad for his character. It's one of those classic roles where he's in the grips of madness. Has he finally gone over the edge? You're looking for the breaking point throughout the movie. Where did he snap? When did it finally happen? The whole question of the film is that this doll that he's, or his ventriloquist dummy, you know, the dummy, is it in possession of him or is he just crazy? And, you know, they provide the answer to that, I think maybe about halfway through the film, but you stay invested in it because it's well written. And there are some pretty good little character actors in there. Yeah, it's pretty well shot. Good looking movie. I would recommend Magic. I'm gonna move on to number 23 on the list here. George A. Romero. He is one of the pivotal horror filmmakers. I finally watched Martin for the first time and I was not let down. It's a masterpiece. It's probably George Romero's best film. I would say that no matter how much credit it ever gets, it's never going to be enough. I can understand that people are put off by the tone of it because it can be serious and disturbing, but then it can be just hilariously funny. And my favorite moment in the film is when Romero himself plays this younger priest who gives a visit to the main character's uncle to give him advice about his nephew. The priest is smoking cigarettes and drinking wine and cracking up. He's cutting up. He's telling the older man that he wishes his church had wine this good. I don't think it's sacrilege to say that their wine is trash. It's really just a beautiful character moment and it's such a small thing in the movie but i live for those little moments things like that stick in my mind and i always find myself coming back to a scene in my head almost like subconsciously i'll be working i'll be at home i'll be doing something and i'll think of this little thing from a film and i'll say what movie was that and it's just one of those beautiful moments i live for stuff like that i love it in movies and martin is just a great film no matter how you cut it it's a film that could be problematic for a lot of people because it is really unsettling in a lot of ways and it's not like a lot of Romero's filmography which is pretty straightforward horror films for the most part. Martin he said was his favorite film and his most personal film and I think that shows and I don't know about you I'm one of those people that if the screen goes to black and the credits are over that I might not stick around through the end credits after you've sat through you know 70 or more minutes of a movie and you get to that black screen with credits you probably are expecting nothing else to happen in the film so you just dip out I'm guilty of that I do it pretty often I love it when they play footage over the credits because I like to stick around and see what's playing and Martin is one of those films you just have to sit all the way through because there's a final a line that's just haunting and it's really terrific i can't say enough good things about this movie two more films from the 70s here number 24 on the list joe dante piranha 1978 now this movie has gained a lot of clout in the last few years they kind of remade it and released it in 3d and i thought that film was honestly really funny when it was released. I saw the Piranha 3D film before the original Piranha, 
And I knew about Piranha and how Judd Dante made it. And I knew about the funny stories of James Cameron working on Piranha 2 and being kicked off the set and trying to, like, steal back equipment or something. But Piranha 3D was my first exposure to these films, and I thought there was great gore. I haven't seen it in a long time. I don't know how my opinion of that would hold up. But the Joe Dante film is really interesting. You've got John Sayles working on the script, and everybody mentions that because John Sayles is one of those guys who does not do horror films. He makes really personal independent films, stuff like Return of the Secaucus 7 or Lone Star, uh, films that totally differ from Piranha. But his touch for those other films lends to this film because you get characters that are based on maybe cliches, but end up getting a lot more development than you expect. The idea of the washed up drunk is applied in this movie, but given a lot more depth than you might expect. And Joe Dante has seen the kind of movies that he's lampooning here, so of course he totally knows how to parody them, and he does it quite well. And I can never say no to a movie with the beloved Paul Bartel, rest in peace, just one of my favorite directors, who I'm a huge fan of, and anytime he appears in a movie, no matter what I think of the movie, I'll never forget him showing up and being the saving grace. Piranha is really funny. It plays on the conventions of the genre, and of course, it knows that you can't maybe make a serious killer fish movie, and is kind of responding to Jaws having been so successful. There's actually a part where they're playing a Jaws arcade cabinet, and there's a lot of tongue-in-cheek stuff in there. And it's definitely worth watching if you like horror comedies, and I'm glad I finally got it off the list. The last 1970s entry on this list... Number 25. The Visitor. 1979. This movie is insane. Alamo Drafthouse re-released it not too long ago. It's hard to believe that any studio could maybe throw money into this project. I will say that it's among a handful of films that I watched last month. The only word to describe the genre is cocaine. It's just, you can tell somebody was zonked out of their mind writing this movie, making this movie, cutting this movie. Anybody, almost in any capacity, involved with the film could probably have been high as a kite. It just seems so brash, and it's all over the place, and it's messy, and it's ridiculous, and it's a ripoff of so many other movies, but it somehow kind of works, and it's worth watching. And it notes the second film, and the last time on this list that Sam Peckinpah, once again, will return as an actor. You may remember I mentioned him earlier because he appeared in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and he appears once again here in The Visitor, 1979. He goes from being a meter man, pretty friendly role, to an abortionist, which is quite a turn. And <laughs> there's a story about his dialogue being overdubbed because he was uh, familiarly sloshed and could not quite deliver the dialogue, not unlike Putney Swope. So they had to dub him, and, you know, God bless that man. The Visitor is insane. If you like movies that are really over the top and don't necessarily make sense, that might be just a mishmash of genres. This is that kind of movie. One thing I found really funny about this movie is that it's an Italian-American co-production, because part of it was filmed at Cinecitta, you know, that famous studio in Italy that produced such great filmmakers, you know, like uh, Fellini worked there, and just so many, you know, classic filmmakers. And they're doing The Visitor at Cinecitta, and then they're also filming it in Atlanta, and it's a beautiful time capsule. I lived in Georgia for probably a little over a decade, and I'm familiar with a lot of parts of Atlanta, and I watched it with a friend of mine, coincidentally, who was visiting, who used to live there too. And we got a big kick out of seeing all these old Atlanta locations, and it's so funny knowing that they were switching between locations so far away from each other. Definitely a movie to watch if you like movies that don't make any sense. There's no resemblance to actuality in this movie and Lance Henriksen shows up and does his Lance Henriksen thing, so that's enough reason for you to watch it anyway. We finish up the 70s, moving on into the 80s now. Number 26. Funeral Home. William Fruitt directing, 1980. Uh, this is one of four Canadian films that I watched for Halloween. I really like a lot of Canadian horror films like The Pit and My Bloody Valentine, 1981. 
And this movie, really interesting. Not one of the better films I watched for Halloween, but I did enjoy it. There's a lot of cheese in there, so B-movie lovers will get that kick out of it. One thing that interested me, I like the imagery toward the end of the film, which almost seems like a sort of response to Toby Hooper, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You've got this corpse that's adorned with these really vibrant-looking flowers, and uh, it's like a sort of shrine. And one thing that really cracked me up about Funeral Home is that the end credits start playing and footage is still rolling and it's exposition. It's just the sloppiest thing you can imagine. There's a character explaining just exactly what was going on with the villain in the movie and they're providing you this while you're seeing like the gaffer's name appear and it just feels like they didn't want the movie to stretch on any longer so they said put the credits over the last minute and a half of the movie and it just has this odd effect. And I have to say, like, I didn't think this film was great by any stretch of the imagination, but it was far preferable to Blue Monkey, which is from the same director, but Funeral Home definitely knocks it out of the water. And it's funny because it's a Canadian film that's very obviously supposed to be American. It's always funny to see people outside America make films that take place here because you can almost always tell something is a little bit off it's like a caricature instead of a representation, and that's amusing. Moving some more into the 80s, I will say, probably my favorite decade for horror films. There's a high ratio of bad movies, bad horror films made in the 80s, but so many of them are just wildly entertaining to me. There's just dozens and dozens of these weird little movies that have scraped along and not been seen by many and they're just now kind of getting their call and it's like a second life for a lot of these movies with companies like intervision and aero video and the previously mentioned vinegar syndrome monto macabro but we're gonna go now into the next film on the list happy birthday to me 1981 i was taken aback by this movie happy birthday to me didn't disappoint it was worth the build-up uh, definitely one of the best slasher films. The last 10 minutes get super twisty, uh, just changes left and right, and oh, you thought it was this? Well, guess what? And like, I can totally see Shyamalan getting a hard on from this movie, and uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It, it really does get quite bizarre toward the end, and I would rank it sort of close to a movie like April Fool's Day. They're both kind of prank-themed horror films, you know, not unlike Sleepaway Camp 2 or maybe some other stuff like that. And I really enjoy these kinds of movies. It's just mean-spirited characters doing nasty things to each other, and that's a turnoff for a lot of people. But I kind of go for that in a lot of movies, not even necessarily just uh, horror, but also comedy, movies like Very Bad Things, or like a kind of mix between the character study, the morality play, and like the gross out movie, you know? It's like a good combination of a lot of those things when you see a film like that. Yeah, I would rank it up there with, like, those offbeat slasher movies. It's not like a straightforward hack em and sack em kind of movie, you know. 1983, Hell of the Living Dead, directed by Vincent Dawn, which is a pseudonym for Bruno Mattai. Hell of the Living Dead was released in 1980 in Spain, but didn't hit the U.S. until 83, I believe. And it came out with a lot of alternate titles like Zombie Creeping Flesh. And it's not one of the best zombie movies. But it does have some pretty iconic images in it. There's a lot of neat little things in the movie. Like I said, I'm a fan of that. There's a moment where a cat jumps out of a woman's intestines and scares this soldier. It's such a nice little touch since you're seeing such a kind of generic zombie slash cannibal troops in the jungle and the reporters trying to get the true story. It's one of those movies. And it's not as effective as something like Cannibal Ferox. And it's not as entertaining as Dawn of the Dead, which it is blatantly ripping off because it's using the same goblin music from that film. But Bruno Mattia is not known as one of those great filmmakers. He's not considered, he's not considered like a, a Fulci or an Argento. He's always known as like, he's the Z movie guy. So you go into a movie like this, and you expect to laugh and have a good time, and maybe it drags on a little too long, but it's pretty fun. And like I said, there's a few moments in there that are definitely memorable. If you don't like zombie movies, if you don't like Italian movies, if you don't like badly dubbed movies, good lord, stay away from this. You know, don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. It is not for you. Next film on the list, we're going to talk about a little movie called Mountaintop Motel Massacre, 1983, directed by Jim McCullough, Sr., 
Jim McCullough and his son both worked on this movie, and it's a sort of a homegrown sort of slasher movie. It does not have a lot of gore or blood in it, so don't go in expecting that kind of movie. It does join that little subgenre of horror movies about motels and hotels and, you know, like Psycho, Motel Hell, and maybe in more recent years stuff like Vacancy or identity it's just these people in the hotel and the creepy owners and what's going on behind the curtain you know toby hooper eaten alive stuff like that it kind of matches up well with another film that i watched that i mentioned earlier funeral home mountaintop motel massacre is not particularly a very good movie but it is enjoyable i found it enjoyable i liked a couple of the characters in it despite the fact that they were you know they're not supposed to be characters that break the mold the meagerness of the budget doesn't really kind of affect the overall impact of the movie, and I think it works that it has this sort of cheaper, homemade feel to it. But it's not showy. It does have a lot of atmosphere. There's a sort of subplot that involves voodoo, which doesn't really contribute a lot to the movie, and unfortunately there's way too many scenes of the main character doing the whole I'm crazy shtick where they just talk to themselves for an extended period of time or walk around and contribute nothing to the story to move it along. So if you don't like a lot of extended scenes of people just blah, 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 I'm crazy, then you know, you're probably not going to want to watch this movie because there's tons of it here but there is one great scene where a guy wakes up covered in cockroaches and just very casually starts brushing them all off of him like this isn't the first time this guy's woken up covered in cockroaches he's like he's not affected by it at all and uh, i gotta i gotta laugh out of that next on the list we've got oakroff 1983 aka the mad mutilator and this is a french film i really really liked Ogroff. I just learned about it recently and I found a copy of it and I watched it and I was sold in the first five minutes and I said to myself how is it that a movie like Prom Night or Final Exam is more popular than this because Mad Mutilator delivers if you are watching your Madman in the Woods movies because you want to see people run around and get killed Go watch Ogroff. It's almost nothing but that. The movie is an extended chase scene, and you do not have to worry about story. You can just sit back and laugh at all the slashing. It's a movie that invites you to take pleasure in rooting for the main character. He's a psychopath who strolls the woods and comes back to his little shack and masturbates with a hatchet handle. In the opening of the movie, you see the mad mutilator killing a young child that's his first victim we're not going to wait 40 minutes to kill the kid and shock you like th this is a movie where we kill kids if you don't want to see that get out and they let you know right off the rip and of course a lot of people are going to love it i feel like fans of olaf ittenbach stuff like that i think you would really enjoy this movie and i'm surprised it's not more popular it's got that nasty 16 millimeter look it's super grimy and it obviously wasn't made for much it's got this really charming title if that's the right word for it, charming, where the, after the kid is killed, the title comes up and it looks like cardboard letters held up on sticks just like in front of the camera, like they were poked into the grass like a yard sign, like you're the number for your house or something like that. I really enjoyed it. Definitely not for everybody, but I thought it was pretty good. Next movie here, Douglas Cheek, 1984, Chud, Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. I liked this movie. I'm glad I finally saw it. I thought uh, the characters were pretty fun in this movie. I liked Daniel Stern as the kind of flagrant, rebellious, sort of homeless guy who's been in these rough situations and demands to tell the people the truth. And it kind of reminded me of Piranha a little bit. The script invests a lot more in its characters and the situations than the average monster movie of that era probably would. And it doesn't really have much of an environmental message or something like Prophecy, that Frankenheimer film. I think it's more interested in setting up these neat little characters that you kind of get to care about. And they put them in this generic monster movie that really doesn't show the monster a whole lot in the first half. Uh, there's not many kills in it. It's not really like a gore kind of movie or anything like that. It's a lot more subtle, and I, I was surprised. I, I enjoyed Chud. Next movie on the list is an absolute stinker. My god. Number 32 of 68. Appointment with Fear, 1985. Talk about an appointment with dog shit. This movie is awful. 
it was recommended to me sort of very loosely by a guy named Rocco. And he said, hey, it's not a good movie, but if you like that feeling of finishing a movie and saying, what the fuck did I just watch? It's great for that. And he was 100% right. I mentioned earlier that The Visitor was a movie that was the byproduct of cocaine usage. And Appointment with Fear is an even better example of that because Appointment with Fear is all over the place. It makes no sense. And it's not even that much fun. There's a lot of unintentionally funny things in it, but the story is just so out of its mind that it can't register what actually makes a story work. You've got this girl who's going around with a satellite dish looking piece of radio equipment. She's eavesdropping on people and it turns out that there's a baby that happens to be the son of a man who's gone crazy and he's now trying to kill the wife and the baby and there's this investigator snooping on them who's like too old for this shit and it's just really really poor it's not something that you'll watch and probably think about a week later it's one of those movies you'll see and then a decade later maybe you'll see someone talk about it or say they'll have watched it and you'll go oh yeah i saw that movie holy shit not a good movie probably one of the worst films on this list Night Train to Terror, 1985. That's the next film on this list. Night Train to Terror is another cocaine movie. I can't imagine the people who made this movie having not done drugs. It throws everything at the wall. It rips out the kitchen sink and then it pulls out the plumbing. This movie is nuts, but unlike Appointment with Fear, Night Train to Terror is vastly entertaining. You get stop motion animation, which I'm a big fan of. Some of it is good, some of it is pretty bad. There's a shot that kind of looks like that RoboCop scene where the guy falls out the window. But Night Train to Terror, I got a big kick out of it. And it's one of many movies that have the grace of having actor Cameron Mitchell in them. Cameron Mitchell is one of those guys I mentioned to someone recently. You see his name come up in the credits of a film, and right away you know this is either going to be really bad or something that you'll have a great time watching. You'll probably remember Cameron Mitchell from Demon Cop or the original Toolbox Murders from the 70s. He's just a guy that won't say no to a paycheck. He's the guy that looks like Santa Claus in Space Mutiny. So that'll give you an idea, I think. But Night Train to Terror is really interesting. I hadn't seen it when I appeared on the Bracken Basement podcast, and that inspired me to watch it this year, as well as a couple others they talked about I hadn't gotten around to, and Night Train to Terror was worth it. I really like this movie. Vinegar Syndrome actually released this movie too, in addition to the previously mentioned House of the Dead. Another good anthology movie, so watch Night Train to Terror if you want to see something on the crazy side. It definitely has things in it that a lot of modern audiences will be tuned out to. There's some weird kind of rapey stuff in the first story that would probably put some people off, but if you can stick it out about 15 minutes into the movie, you'll make it through the rest. The bookends are really, really interesting. It's God and the devil fighting for whose lives they're going to claim on a train that's about to crash. And for some reason, there's a full band playing on this train. Like, there's a fucking saxophonist on this train. Like, who would want to ride on a train with a full band, including a saxophonist? That would be the most annoying ride ever. Night Train to Terror deals in that world of the bizarre and unwieldy. And I quite enjoyed it. So definitely check that out. Critters, 1986. I saw this theatrically. This was one of two films I saw for All Freakin' Night this year in Olympia. That's an all-night horror festival they play at the Capitol Theater. It's been around for 30 years. Hopefully it'll be around for 30 more. Critters was really good. It was the second film they played the night of the all-night horror show, and that was a great choice to play it so early on because it's not per se a horror film. It's a monster movie with a lot of comedic elements and some very minor sci-fi stuff going on. You've got some really cool character actors in there. Lynn Shay from Dead End and there's something about Mary is in there and you've got M. Emmett Walsh who Roger Ebert once said if you see a movie with M. Emmett Walsh or Harry Dean Stanton it's going to be worth watching and I definitely agree with that. M. Emmett Walsh is the stereotypical fat cop in this movie who doesn't know what he's doing and ends up getting burned for it of course and it's just a really fun movie. There's Billy Zane is in it and he's got hair and I, it made me laugh really hard that a lot of women in the audience were catcalling him the moment he appeared on screen it's not maybe an intelligent movie this is the kind of film where you get subtitles of an alien saying fuck you to someone 
but it is worth watching if you like horror comedies and if you have that 80s nostalgia it's definitely worth checking out i think it's more fun than chud and of course the fourth film in the series has a very young leonardo dicaprio so as you progress through the series you get to get to that fun critters marks the 34th film on the list for my 2018 halloween viewing and with that being said this is the end of part one of the Halloween episode of the first episode of the Video Psychosis Podcast. We went through the years 1933 through 1986. The second part of this episode, coming soon, is going to cover films number 35 through 68. We're going to go from 1986 into 2018. So join me again soon for another episode of the Video Psychosis Podcast. I'm Strong Knots, 